Good morning, boys and girls. I'm so happy to be here, and I have an exciting story to tell you today. It's our last story about Jeremiah the prophet, and it's right here in my Bible. Dawson, sit still. Good boy. Chapter 38. Now listen to what happens to Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah is a prophet. That means he tells God's people what God wants them to hear. And Jeremiah had a very, very important message for the people of Judah because something bad was going to happen. Jeremiah said, Judah is going to be attacked by the army of Babylon, and they're going to kill everybody in Judah. So you must leave. You must go live in another country, and at just the right time, God will call you back. But if you leave, you will be safe. If you stay, you will die. And he kept saying it over and over because it was the truth, boys and girls. But the people did not listen to Jeremiah. They did not believe what he said. And four of the king's men went to the king and they said, King Zedekiah, we need to do something about Jeremiah. He's discouraging everybody. He says we're going to die. And King Zedekiah said, do whatever you want with Jeremiah. So do you know what these bad guys did? They no, they didn't kill him. They tried to, but these men got some ropes and they tied it around Jeremiah and they lowered him into a cistern. Now, a cistern is like a deep well, except this cistern didn't have any water in it. You know what it had in it? Mud. Lots and lots of mud. So they lowered Jeremiah into the cistern and soon he was covered with mud. He didn't have any food. He didn't have any water. It's not that deep, buddy. He didn't have any water, and he was all alone, except he wasn't really all alone because he knew God was with him. God was in his head. God was in his heart, and he kept thinking. This is what I think Jeremiah kept thinking. He knew the promise of God that said, be strong and courageous, for I will never leave you or forsake you. And that whole time Jeremiah was in the cistern, he was thinking, be strong and courageous, for I will never leave you or forsake you. But then a nice guy that worked for the king, his name was ebed Melik. Isn't that kind of a funny name, ebed Melik? He went to the king, and he said, King Zedekiah, Jeremiah was thrown into the cistern, and he's going to die unless we take him out. So King Zedekiah changed his mind, and he said, okay, take 30 of my men and go take Jeremiah out of the cistern. So ebed Melik went to the storeroom in the palace, and he got lots of old clothes and rags, and he threw them down in the cistern, and he told Jeremiah, put them under your arms and put your clothes on so the ropes don't hurt you. They lowered a rope down. Jeremiah tied it around himself, and slowly they pulled Jeremiah out of that deep cistern. And he was safe. He was alive, and he was happy. But do you think that stopped Jeremiah from telling people what was going to happen? No. For 40 years, Jeremiah told the people God's words. And he kept thinking to himself, be strong and courageous. So I want to talk about courage. What is courage today, boys and girls? What is it, Taylor? Um, uh, you have to be in God who helps you every time. She got the perfect answer. Did you hear that? You have to believe in God, and he helps you every time. Because courage, boys and girls, it's just not being brave or being fearless. S courage is God's strength within us. And you're right, Taylor. When we believe in Jesus, we have God's strength in us, and we can have all the courage we need, just like Jeremiah had courage. Isn't that wonderful? So we're going to end a little differently today because I want you to remember that verse. So I want you to repeat after me, okay? Be strong and courageous, for I will never leave you or forsake you. Okay, let's say it again. Be strong and courageous, for I will never leave you or forsake you. Okay, church, everybody, let's shout our praise to the Lord. Let's say it. Be strong and courageous, for I will never leave you or forsake you. Thank you, God, for that promise. Okay. So as Miss Beth uh, noted, we will uh, uh, be 
wrapping up our Jeremiah study today with a, a look at the 38th chapter. You know, I remember very well, of course, the day that my daughter was born and made me a father for the first time and how excited I was. And then two or three months after that, we went out to Oklahoma to show off the new baby, of course, and we'd see my parents and, and gathered the family together. And, and my niece, who was like two or three years old, was like hovering over Bethany's little carrier and looking at her. And I said, she's beautiful, isn't she? She said, yes. And I said, I built her, you know. <laughs> and she looks at me and she says, you can't build skin. <laughs> and of course, you can't build skin. And skin is amazing stuff, isn't it? The thing that surrounds us, and, and you know, one of the amazing things about skin is if, if we get a cut, if we get a tear, if we get a puncture, and the blood is coming out, immediately our body reacts to that. It sends platelets, it sends these sticky protein things, and they start at the edge and they work towards the middle to close it off so we don't lose the blood from within us. And if you hold a, a bad cut together, it literally helps it to work. And then after it's come back together, it forms that scab that protects the new skin that is being built underneath it. Or sometimes if it's a really bad cut, the new scar tissue that will hold that place together. And we know that, right? We know the basics. We know that we should wait for that scab to do its work and then it will fall off naturally. But isn't it hard not to pick at it? Isn't it hard not to, not to just feel that and mess with it or, or that little place in our mouth that's sore and we, our tongue just keeps going back there again and again? Why do we do these kind of irrational things? And it's not just little kids that do it either, is it? Even as adults, even though we know something's there for a purpose, it's really easy to want to do something otherwise anyway well look with me at jeremiah 38 and stand as you're able as we begin with verses 14 and following as jeremiah deals with a king that doesn't have the courage to act jeremiah 38 14 and following king zedekiah sent for the prophet jeremiah and received him at the third entrance of the temple of the lord the king said to jeremiah i have something to ask you do not hide anything from me Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, if I tell you, you will put me to death, will you not? And if I give you advice, you will not listen to me. So King Zedekiah swore an oath in secret to Jeremiah. As the Lord lives who gave us our lives, I will not put you to death or hand you over to those men who seek your life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. So we start the passage with an unfaithful king coming to the faithful prophet and saying secretly, I need some direction from you. Now, Jeremiah sees a red flag automatically. You know about red flags. You know, it's those things when, when something happens, and you're like, whoa, this is indicating to me danger of some sort that I better watch out for. The way this person is relating to me, the things they're saying, the way they're acting is showing that this is not the situation that it looks like on the outside. This is the guy that persecuted Jeremiah before. This is the guy that has ordered him arrested. This is the guy that has attacked him at times. And Jeremiah wonders, is this a trap? Is this an attempt to manipulate me? Is this an attempt to get some evidence so that he can have a justification for putting me to death, for saying the things he doesn't want to hear? Well, it's not as Jeremiah suspects. It's more based upon Zedekiah's weakness that leads him to secretly come to the prophet and ask him for information. Now, Zedekiah claims he needs more information. And at this point, if you've read the book, you're like, wait a minute. The word that Jeremiah keeps speaking is not enough. The scroll that Jeremiah wrote and sent is not enough. The preaching that Jeremiah has been doing for almost 40 years is not enough. 
information for the king to decide on that? You know, we, we have an idea in our society that if there's a problem, the first response is to give some education. And for at least a lot of times, it goes to the second step of if we just get the right information to the right people, that will solve the problem. All we got to do is retrain somebody. All we got to do is educate somebody. All we got to do is tell somebody what they need to know, and then everything's taken care of. Well, folks, I'm a huge believer in education. I kept going degree after degree until my family thought I was going to be a professional student and never get a real job. And I believe in continuing education. I like to learn. I think it's important for us to learn. It's important to train people. But knowing the right thing and doing the right thing are two different things. And some of the most educated people some of the people that have the most learning and information make some of the worst decisions in their lives, right? I remember taking my late wife to Barnes to the cancer center and driving up on the morning for her to do her radiation treatment and seeing a line of cancer patients out there, some of them with their little IV tree smoking in the parking lot. And next to them were doctors and nurses smoking at the cancer center in the parking lot. Knowing the right thing and doing the right thing, like with that scab that's healing that cut, but you got to be picking at it, are two different things. And the idea that there's a little bit more information that's going to solve this problem is not true. Zedekiah already has all the information that he needs. And yet here he is secretly going to Jeremiah and saying, Tell me one more time what I need. Tell me one more time what I need to do. Many problems in life take more than just the facts, just the background information, just the parameters in order to solve them. So let's pick up again Jeremiah 38, verses 17 and following. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you will only surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then your life shall be spared, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then this city shall be handed over to the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and you yourself shall not escape from their hand. King Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Judeans who have deserted to the Chaldeans, for I might be handed over to them, and they would abuse me. Jeremiah said, that will not happen. Just obey the voice of the Lord and what I say to you, and it shall go well with you, and your life shall be spared. But if you are determined not to surrender, this is what the Lord has shown me. A vision of the women remaining in the house of the king of Judah being led out to the officials of the king of Babylon and saying, your trusted friends have seduced you and overcome you. Now that your feet are stuck in the mud, they desert you. All your wives and your children shall be led out to the Chaldeans, and you yourself shall not escape from their hand, but shall be seized by the king of Babylon, and this city shall be burned with fire. There is a tragedy at the very heart of the book of Jeremiah. Much of the book is focused upon this tragedy that happens to the Jewish people, to the holy city of Jerusalem, to the temple that God has ordered to be built there. There is a tragedy at the very core, and it ends up being an awful situation. And before this tragedy comes to full fruition, the hard times that are there call for difficult decisions. They call for strong leadership. They call for somebody at the helm to say, this is what we need to do, and we need to do the right thing in this situation. Babylon looms over Judah. They have to decide, will we continue to serve them as a vassal? Will we send them our tribute? Will we let them direct our foreign policy and live our lives as we did before? Or will we revolt against them and try to overcome them? And people are divided on how to respond. There are literally different parties 
within the, 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 the royalty, within the leadership, some say we need to revolt, some say we need to surrender, and at the middle, the guy that's got the final say is King Zedekiah. He's the one that needs to make the decision. He's getting competing ideas. And Jeremiah has been saying over and over and over, if you want to do what God calls you to do, you will serve the Babylonians at this time, in this place. And if you don't want to do that, it's going to be a disaster. It's not going to go well. Zedekiah has the final say, and I think in a sense he knew what was right, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. He could not make the choice that he seems to even recognize as the right choice. He says, I'm afraid what will happen to me. And even when Jeremiah assures him and says, this is not going to happen, God's not going to let this happen, he doesn't have the courage and the strength to act. And because of that, it will end in tragedy. And the nation will suffer. And he will suffer. He tries to flee. And I think this whole scene about the women being taken out to the king because him and his top advisors run and they get caught and brought before the king and he has to see his sons killed in front of him and his own eyes put out before he goes away in slavery. It's a tragic situation a time when there needed to be strong leadership and none was found. How do we avoid that situation in our own life? How do we avoid suffering from making decisions that are not good? How do we make the right decision when we feel the pressures of life and the struggles of life, whether they're little bitty pressures or whether they're great big pressures, whether it's a question that's going to have a little impact or one that's going to have long lasting impact well that's that's a good question there's a lot that goes into that but i have three things that come from this passage i want to share with you first of all number one be careful who you want to please and why zedekiah wants to please those who say we should revolt he wants to please those that are pushing him that direction he's worried about humans or at least not displeasing humans, when Jeremiah knows it's God that he should be worrying about. He wants to please those that are putting peer pressure on him. Now, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Even a king in the day where the king had all this power has peer pressure on him. And it's not just young people that feel it. Adults get it too. We have pressure coming from every which direction. And it's often our view of ourself that's a part of that pressure on us. We want other people to see us in a certain way. We want to be known in a certain way. I have a neighbor, and I'm not going to mention any names because you guys might know who it is. But I will hear him out there mowing his lawn, and his lawn is immaculate. And then I'll go out and mow it two days later, and he immediately comes out and mows his again. And, and I thought, well, maybe it's just me. You know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm just not noticing this enough. And I went over and visited my neighbors that were getting ready to move about six months ago. And she said, did you ever notice that every time you go out to mow your lawn, that guy mows his lawn again? She said, he does the same thing when I mow the lawn. He has to be the last person to have his lawn mowed. And, and he feels some kind of pressure on this. He's got to be the best lawn in the neighborhood. Me, on the other hand, I, I'm like the embarrassment of the neighborhood when it comes to the lawn stuff. But, but we feel that pressure sometimes. And the king feels the pressure of these nobles, of these people that are on the other side. He fears their wrath. He fears their displeasure. He's playing to an audience of people that probably really don't even care about him. Jeremiah, on the other hand, plays to an audience of one. What's important to him is that God be followed, God be obeyed, God be listened to. And if it upsets other people, well, that's just too bad. He's going to do what God asked him to do. Reminds me of when Martin Luther 
was called before this council, and he knew that Jan Hus and others had been put to death for their questioning of the church, and they asked him to recant of his writings and his words, to turn back on it, to say they were wrong, and he said, you know, popes and councils have been wrong. I stand on the word of God. I can do no other. Here I stand. And he refused to go back because his audience was God, not the officials of the church. It's like in Acts 5 when they called Peter in. The same people that killed Jesus just very recently. And they said, you need to quit telling people that we killed Jesus and that he's alive again. And they'd already thrown him in prison. And they'd already beat him. And they were threatening to kill him. And Peter, who at one point had denied Jesus, said, I can't do that. If it comes between obeying God and obeying you, I'm going to obey God. I'm going to do what God calls me to do. And he just kept talking about Jesus. What's your audience? Who are your audience? And are they worthy for you to base your life upon pleasing them? Secondly, to not decide eventually is to decide. To not decide eventually is to decide. Zedekiah keeps gathering information. He keeps looking for somebody to tell him something that's just going to make the decision for him. And he never quite gets there. He never gets to that point that it doesn't need to be made anymore. And he doesn't have the courage to make it. You know, my, my, my dear old dad who passed in 2012, and I know many of you are thinking about dads that have gone before on, on this day. But my dear old dad used to say, either cut bait or fish. There comes a time that you need to make a decision. He used to also say, either go to the party or get out of the bathroom, although it was a little bit more colorful the way he said that one. But you know what I'm saying. There's a, there's a time for gathering information. There's a time for analyzing the problem. And then there's a time to act. And Zedekiah never could get to that point. The envelope of a decision matters. And it really matters when you're talking about your eternal destiny. It really matters when you're talking about somebody's life with God, somebody's future with God. You know, there's a country song, and I can't remember the name of it right now, that says, you know, we feel like we've got all this time, and it really doesn't matter whether we do it today or not until it matters, until it's too late, until the opportunity has passed. Don't put off until tomorrow what needs to be done today. Don't keep gathering information on a decision that down in your heart you know may be difficult to make, but it needs to be made today. It needs to happen now. To not decide eventually becomes to decide. And then third, fear is not a good decision maker. Fear is not a good decision maker. You know, we uh, hear a lot on the news about the problems with the United States elections, with the whole thing, and some people say it's because we need voter IDs, and some people say it's because we don't need voter IDs, and some people say it's how we count the ballots and stuff. But you know what I think the problem with American elections is? Is that they're based on fear too much. I mean, at this point, I'm getting about three or four of these a day. How about you guys? They don't tell me what a candidate's for. They don't say this is an important policy for us to follow and so-and-so is going to follow that. They tell me what the other guy is going to do that's going to ruin the country if they get elected. And they use words like dangerous and risky and catastrophe and disaster. Fear words. And, and elections become based not on what anybody stands for in a positive way, it's what the other guy might do according to his opponent or her opponent. The other woman might do if she gets elected. It's gotten to the point of ridiculousness, folks. And, and the fact is, as a human, when we make a decision based on fear, we're using that really basic reptile part of our brain, that fight or flight aspect, that part that doesn't give you much choice, and it's not very good at assessing danger. Sometimes the things that we're most afraid of are the ones that are least likely to hurt us, and the ones that we don't fear at all are the ones that are really the source of danger. 
But when we make decisions thinking about it and analyzing it and talking to trusted counselors and seeking God's will and the word of God and in the community of God, then we're using the image of God, if I could put it that way, part of our brain. Then we're using the part that God has given us to analyze, to make decisions, to seek the truth, and to be willing to follow the truth. Never, ever, if you can at all help it, other than when there's a rattlesnake in front of you or a bear is chasing you, make a decision based on fear. Remember what Jesus said? Perfect love casts out fear. God has put within us a spirit that is not fearful because we know who wins. We know the plans that God has. We know what happened with Jesus. We know what God has planned for us. And love should guide our decisions. And responsibility should guide our decisions. And faithfulness and courage and Christian virtues. Not fear. Not things that the enemy uses as a tool. We don't have to be those people. Because we know the God of the universe and he has promised us that not even death itself can separate us from his incredible love. So let's close off this passage of Jeremiah 38 with the sad fate that comes at 24 and following. Then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, Do not let anyone else know of this conversation or you will die. If the official should hear that I have spoken with you and come to say to you, just tell us what you said to the king. Do not conceal it from us or we will put you to death. What did the king say to you? Then you shall say to them, I was presenting my plea to the king not to send me back to the house of Jonathan to die there. All the officials did come to Jeremiah and questioned him and he answered them in the very words the king had commanded. So they stopped questioning him for the conversation had not been overheard. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard until the day that Jerusalem was taken. What fateful words that ends with, until the day Jerusalem was taken. The tragedy plays itself out. And for Jeremiah, it must have been like watching a slow motion train wreck. You can't do anything about it. You wish you could. And yet it's coming and it happens. It's the tragedy of Zedekiah who was destroyed because he never could make the right decision. It was the tragedy of the Judean people who suffered death and exile and all kinds of terrible things. It was the tragedy of Jerusalem that was in ruins when it was over with and the temple was burnt down. And the most tragic part is it didn't have to be that way. The king had a good counselor in Jeremiah. The king had a God who kept trying over and over and over to tell him exactly what to do, and he wouldn't listen to him. The king had the power, even though he was afraid to use it, to make the right decision. And instead, we have a king sneaking around because he's afraid of his own counselors. He never had the courage to do what he needed to do. We don't want to be in that category, folks. We don't have to be in that category. We have a God who loves us, a God who's willing to guide us and direct us and encourage that is filled with courage to do the right thing. Look with me at the words of Jesus and found in Matthew 10, verses 28 through 31. Jesus says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are, you not, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet one of, not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Fear God and dread nothing else. Fear God and trust in God to get you through because Jesus says first of all because he's the one that's got the power but secondly he cares for you he knows every detail of your life you mean something to God and he won't let you down it takes courage 
to face the decisions we have to face in life. It takes it in an individual sense at times. It takes it in a family sense. It takes it when it comes to your job or your school or your, your neighbors or your career. It also takes courage for us as a church to do the right thing. And we're constantly having to be in that situation of changing things so that we continue to be able to do our mission of reaching people, transforming lives with the power of Jesus Christ. Uh, you've, you've seen one little change we made. We've gone from a every other month newsletter that wasn't getting read very much and was getting mailed out to all kinds of folks that probably didn't pay much attention to it to one that is going to be quarterly but has a whole lot more content that is focused more on connecting you to God and helping you to be a part of the community, the body. And so there are those that are available at the doorway. I invite you to take one. I invite you to read it. And I invite you to pass that on to someone who's not got a church home, who doesn't know what it means to belong to a community. And you might find that it helps connect you to them. We're working on a new website. We're working on some new ways that we present ourselves to the community so that we can connect better with the idea that we want the people of this area to know Jesus Christ. Now, they may not be ready, but then some crisis might come along in their life, and all of a sudden they realize they need God. And we want them to know where to find God when they do. We're going to have to make decisions in the future. We as a body, and they won't be easy decisions. It'll be things for us to indeed study and pray about and struggle with. And we need to do it in such a way that we get the real understanding and the real facts that we don't let the media or outside forces tell us when they're not even correct. But we have to have the courage as the body of Christ to listen to the voice of God and respond to it whether it's popular in our world or not, whether we feel the pressure of those around us or not, because ultimately there's one person that we all answer to, and that is the God of the universe who has proven his love to us in sending his son to die for us. The one who knows us the best, the one who knows what is best for us, the one who has promised to be with us the one who has the power to get us through. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your incredible love and all the ways you bless us and guide us. Help us to be your people. In, in all the, the noise and the, the voices and the, those that are willing to tell us exactly what we need to do and where we need to go and what needs to happen, help us to hear your voice clearly, to know your will. And help us to have the courage to act upon what you tell us. To follow the guidance that you give us. To be your people, shaped by your character, doing your will to your glory in a world that's lost and full of darkness. We thank you for your love for us and how you've claimed us. We thank you that you are our Heavenly Father and that you sent your Son for us. And we pray all this in the powerful and loving name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So we have a response time. Our worship team will lead us once again. And we will have an opportunity if you have something that God has laid upon your heart, if you just need prayer or direction for you to respond to that, I'm available. We also have this as an opportunity, if you've not had a chance yet, to come and say a prayer for our two individuals that we have quilts for today. And then after we're done with worship today, those quilts will be presented to them so that they can have that as a reminder of the prayers that the people of God have said for them. Will you rise? Will you join me in singing our song?